All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number 267 of the Restoring Rapport podcast. We're super excited for the content we've got planned out for you guys today. As always, this is a podcast for young believers who are pursuing the goal of marriage and family and trying to get married as young as possible in a healthy way. I'm your host, Seth Hensley. I come on twice a week, every week to discuss not only the benefits of getting married young, but I try to equip and encourage you in your pursuit of that goal. And today we're going to be reviewing an article that was posted by the Gospel Coalition called Help, I Want to Get Married but I can't afford it. And a lot of you guys who are young and looking to get married are kind of running into this problem of we've created a a culture where we're basically have harder options when it comes to getting married young, because it's when you're young, instead of going the apprenticeship route and then moving into, you know, a master becoming a master in a trade and providing people value that way and making money from that. We're now going to college for four years, going in lots of debt um, to get paid, you know, wages that we usually use to spend getting out of debt. (laughs) So um, it can be hard to, especially if you haven't had the time to go through college to make the good wages. A lot of people think that it can be hard to make a livable and sustainable wage Uh, while you're still young. And so today we're going to kind of go through some of those myths. We're going to kind of myth bust, if you will, uh, and talk about how you can make money and support a family while you're still young and just kind of go over some actual practical tips on how to do that Um, because it is definitely possible. I know that a lot of people don't have that experience and they think that you have to go to college or that you have to, um, you know, spend so much time in, you know, whatever field in order to make money in that field. But there are ways to make money while you're young. Um, and there's also this misconception that we're going to get into of people think that you have to be somehow like rich before you're ready to get married, which is exactly how I think it's not designed to be. <laughs> I mean, I think you should get married as early as possible that so, so that you can grow together and you don't miss out on those years together. Um, and yes, that might may entail, you know, more financial difficulties than it would if you were to postpone your marriage, you know, let's say into your 40s or 50s. Why not 60s? Hey, why not get married until uh, you're 60 years old and you're retired and you're living comfortably? And of course, the answer to that question is um, that you've missed, you know, 40 years, 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, five years, two years. I don't care. You've missed that. Whatever the number is, you've missed that time. Um, with your spouse. You haven't spent your time with the person that you're going to be with for the rest of your life. And so um, it really comes down to what do you value more? Do you value more that time that you got would get to spend with your spouse if you got married young? Or do you value living more comfortably? And I think one of those answers has a clear, is is clearly of more value. One of those things is more valuable. And uh, as you guys are listening to the show, I would imagine you agree. Um, And so we're just going to kind of go through the practical Uh, steps because it is hard. I'm not denying the fact that it is hard to get married young. I'm not saying that it's not difficult, but I am saying it is possible. It is worthwhile if you can do it in many cases. I'm not saying it's right for everybody. There are lots of people that this is obviously not right for. Um, People who have gotten divorced because they got buried what they would say too young. Uh, People who uh, are rushing into something. People who are getting married for, you know, you can get married for lots of reasons that aren't good. But, you know, a good reason to get married is that you want to spend as much time as you can with the person that you love more than anything. That's a good reason to get married young. And so um, I'm going to enable those of you guys who are getting married young because of that reason and other good reasons that we've detailed elsewhere on the show. You can go back and listen to those episodes if you want. Um, I'm going to be giving you guys who are getting married young because of those reasons, the good reasons, uh, tools on how to basically get married when you don't have much money. And when I think back to I'm 25 now. When I think back to my my life before I was married, what I needed to do uh, to get married, um, it was very well laid out and clear for me because I had, you know, a good idea of what I wanted to do. And this is going to be something that I'm going to harp on over and over in this video. Um, you're going to have to know, you're going to have to pick something and stick to it, have a plan, and begin pursuing that plan as quickly as possible. Um, so that you're not basically wasting time because wasting time is what kills um, your ability to get married young and to get married soon. And so that's going to kind of be your biggest enemy uh, in this process. And I'm going to go over that several times. But moving on to the article title, as you can see, if you're subscribed to the show or watching on YouTube, the article title is Help. I want to get married, but I can't afford it. It was published by Russ Gerlin. 
Gerline, maybe, on April 10th in the year 2023, so last year. Um, and they have an editor's note here. Uh, the Gospel Coalition's Thorns and Thistles column seeks to apply wisdom and practical advice about faith, work, and economics. If you have a question on how to think about the practice, your your work in a way that honors God, let us know at asktgc.org. So to give you a background on this writer, he is young and wanted to get... Oh, no, this is the question. I'm sorry. This is the prompt the, the, that uh, prompted this article to be written. It says, I'm a young and I want to get married soon to my amazing Christ-loving girlfriend, but I don't have money to provide for a marriage. What should I do? So we have a young man here, presumably, uh, who is wanting to get married. Awesome. Great job, man. Uh, to his amazing Christ-loving girlfriend. That is amazing. Wonderful. So he has a girlfriend that he loves, that he is proud to show that he loves her. He thinks she's amazing. Uh, she's a believer. Um, and he's trying to get married to her, but he doesn't have what he th what he considers to be enough money. And we're going to get into whether or not that's tr actually true um, in a minute. And obviously, I don't know this particular young man, so I don't know if he does in reality have enough money. But I know a lot of people think they don't have enough money when in reality they do. Um, what they don't have enough money for is a luxurious lifestyle um, and that they can bring into their marriage and stay afloat. <laughs> and then my question to those people is, again, all right, what do you want more? Do you want more time with your spouse and have less lug a less luxurious lifestyle? Or do you want a more luxurious lifestyle and then giving up years with your spouse? That's really what it comes down to. And again, I obviously, I'm biased. Obviously, if you're listening to the show, you probably agree with me. Um, but I think time with your spouse is infinitely preferable to having more money and more things and more stuff. I really do not see any contest there. I definitely would go with more time with my spouse any day of the week. Um, maybe it's just because I have such an awesome wife. I don't know, but that's just me personally. <clears throat> he says, I love this question. It's sincere, hopeful, Christ-centered, and practical. Um, I do want to, something I do, I just want to be sensitive about in Christian circles. A lot of times people will just throw in Christ loving, and then they will be deemed Christ centered just because they threw in that adjective into their sentence. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know, kind of, I guess I'm just, I don't want, this guy could have a Christ loving girlfriend without him saying that. And it's not really the place of this guy's, um, this guy writing the article to say whether or not, um, this young man has a Christ, Christ centered, uh, you know, outlook. But he he is he is talking about just the question, so I guess it doesn't matter really. And I, I would I would say the same thing just to provide clarity. Uh, he says, I assume you're looking for advice beyond saving up for a wedding. It seems you you're you desire financial stability to support a family over the long haul. What do you want is good, godly thing. So kudos to this author for saying that his this young man's desire to get married is a good and godly thing. Most people will try to dissuade young people who are in that situation, and that I think is not right to do for a number of reasons, but. Um, I just want to say to this young guy and anybody like him who's listening to the show, which you probably are, um, that you are pursuing a good thing in your desire to get married young. That is a good desire. Um, it's definitely something that God has given you, definitely a calling, definitely a passion, definitely a pursuit, something that has its difficulties, just like any calling of life, but something that is nonetheless um, a desirable, worthy, noble you know, goal in alignment with God's design for your life. Um, definitely a good thing. <clears throat> Scripture says in Proverbs, to delight in the wife of your youth, um, you know, it's just a wonderful thing that uh, is very is very scripturally uh, backed. So your decision to get married is definitely scripturally backed. Um, so you don't have to worry about people who and it, if somebody comes at, at you with one of these red pillar arguments um, or something like that that are attacking marriage from a secular viewpoint. There are arguments that I give you uh, to combat those um, arguments as well. But right now I'm focusing on kind of the Christian arguments against getting married because, believe it or not, they are out there. Some Christians will actually try and dissuade people from getting married, which truly shocks me. Um, and oftentimes it's not of a place of um, malicious intent. It's just out of concern or they don't feel like the person is quote-unquote ready or has the quote-unquote spiritual maturity or is quote-unquote financially stable. They use all these different reasons. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes maybe those have you know, a good founding, especially if that person knows you well and is telling you that you need to think about some things before you get married. But oftentimes people just say that because they've had a poor experience with people who have gotten married young and they've seen bad stories of people who have gotten married young. And so they think it's a bad idea altogether when in reality, there's a right way to get married young. 
And so you, for every person you show me who's had a terrible marriage because they got married too young, I can show you a couple who's doing great and is going to be married to their partner for longer um, because they made the choice to get married young. And so uh, you can't just use this anecdotal story-based experience argument to con to slam, you know, getting married young as a decision because I can give you lots of stories that are great of people who are doing well because they got married young. So now that we got that out of the way, he says, let us let me proceed by exploring what marriage requires and then how we can get there. What marriage requires. The first and most important biblical principle regarding marriage comes from Genesis 2.24. Jesus quoted this verse in Matthew 19.5 where he gives us God's original intent for marriage, an intimate, permanent covenant relationship between a man and a woman. In Genesis, this verse comes after God makes Adam from the dust and Eve from one of Adam's ribs. God states, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's a famous verse, a beautiful verse um, that just has so much truth to it. When you get married, it is imperative and critical that there is a separation of, I would say, mostly primarily a financial separation. And it's not a tangible separation. It's not like a geographical or financial separation from parents. It has to be a separation of where one's priority is. When I was a single person, my my ultimate authority under God was my parents. And my ultimate um, you know, relationship under God that I was most interested in keeping healthy was my relationship with my parents. But that has to change and had to change when I got married. If if my relationship with my mother or father um, stayed more important to me than my relationship with my wife post us getting married, our marriage would not work well. We would have some problems. A lot of problems, um, you know, there has to be a clear transition of priority uh, from parents to spouse when you get married. Your spouse has to become your new priority, your new preference, your new ultimate place of authority under God. And so, um, that's kind of, I think, what the wisdom of that verse is getting at, and I think the main wisdom of that verse is. Uh, it says, this is expected, the expected order things, leaving and then cleaving. So what does marriage require? The implication is a man needs to be independent of his old family and able to support a new family. Um, again, I don't, I would disagree maybe with this author um, on necessarily the nature of that independence. I don't like the word independence because I think we all need to practice interdependence, be dependent on one another, and anybody who thinks he or she is independent is just lying to his or herself. Uh, you are not that powerful. You are not powerful. You are not capable of being an independent ind individual and being healthy. If you char start to try and not need anybody, that gets you in a very unhealthy place very, very fast in every area of life. And so the way I would say this is, the spouse has to have your new place of priority, and you have to be able to take care of her and your children. Now, when I say take care of her and your children, I do not mean you have to be able to provide your wife and child with a seven-bedroom, luxurious, $2 million beachfront home. That's not what I mean by provide. Um, what is necessary in order to provide is a lot less than what I think sometimes young believers make it. Um, and I'm not saying you need to be destitute and poor. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. Uh, hear me here. I'm saying that you you actually think you need more than you do. You think you need more than you do. Um, and because of that, you think you're ready far later into, in life than you are to get married. And so for financial reasons. And so um, that's just kind of the thought I'm going to give him there. Again, the end of the word independent that he's using right here, I, I don't really agree with that, but well, well, let's just say, I think he could have chosen a way better word or phrase that differently. He says the new couple should be able to stand on their own relationally and financially. Um, this doesn't mean newlyweds don't need support from biological and church family, but it does mean they don't set out assuming that others will regularly pay their bills. This is big. Um, he says being, let's see, re financially, and relationally ready for marriage means that you don't assume other people will regularly pay your bills. And this 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 is important. I agree with him here. This is having a plan. This is having a means to implement your plan, having a means to actually put money down towards the things that you need, not the things that you want, but the things that you need um, to have a comfortable life with your wife. Um, and so it would be very presumptuous and rude, I think, of you to expect someone to support 
you and your wife. I think that's your job as a man. Um, and it's your job not to be lazy. It's your job to be a contributor. It's your job to actually put bread on the table, provide value to someone to earn a wage somehow that you can then use to basically provide for your family. That's your job as a man. You don't need to expect someone else to take care of your wife. Your job as a man is to take care of your wife. And so, and again, I say, I'm talking like I'm talking to a man here because 80% of this show, well, really more like 75 now, but 75 to 80% of this show's listeners are young men, ages 18 to 24. And so, um, obviously I'm, I use, I'm, I act like I'm talking to a man a lot, but we do have female listeners. So that applies for you as well. I mean, just basically it's a life skill, not to assume that other people are going to take care of you. You just need to be a hard worker. Basically that's just having a good work, work ethic, common sense. Uh, you don't have to be old to have one of those, believe it or not. You know, you don't, you don't magically acquire one of those when you're 30 years old and the world then sometimes or somehow says, yes, you're magically now ready to get married. No, you can have a good work, work ethic and be able and willing to provide for a family at a younger age, you know, and there's no, and people can't say that there are no people like that. Cause I know them. I know great people like that. I have lots of friends who decided to get married young. I got, I got married as young as I could have. I actually still got married you know, about five years below the national average age of first marriage for men. But I got married at what I, at an age that I would consider old. And that's about 24. I was married at 24 and I would consider a good age to get married on average being about 20. And so, um, maybe you disagree with me on that. Let me know, but that's what I think. And I'm not going to change my mind just because it's, you know, a cliche statement to say that getting married young is a bad idea. I need a presented with better arguments than that. And so far, all the arguments that are in line with my life experience um, and all the best arguments, I think, uh, are in line with getting married young much of the time. Again, not for everybody, but for a lot of people. So his next subheading is develop a plan. He says, if you're at the age where you're seriously considering marriage, I do hope you're already involved in some kind of education or training program or working full time. If not, this is the place to start. As you save for an engagement ring and a wedding, you need a steady income or the anticipation of one to afford a roof over your head, food on the table, and other essentials. Okay, now this is where this is where my first point is going to come in. Um, what he is, you know, arguing as an essential, he's he's using the word essential here. I think a lot of those things are not essential, and so. Let me explain what I think an essential is. I think essentials are food, water, shelter, you know, air conditioning, uh, a car, a means of transportation, um, you know, things that your wife likes. Those are essentials. Um, things like that. Those are essentials. What he's considering essential is a really expensive engagement ring, a really expensive wedding. Uh, let's see what else a roof overhead food on the table and other essentials. So those, those last ones I think are, are correct. Those are the ones that I think he's correct on. So essentials would be a roof over your head, food on the table and other, other essentials gets a little ambigu ab ambiguous. And again, I think he said other essentials here because there aren't that many other essentials. When you think about it, like a roof over your head, a place to live, uh, you have to have a means of feeding yourself. You have to have water. You have to have air conditioning. You have to have uh, things that your wife would like, stuff like that. Those are essentials. But I think that the reason he only listed two here is because there aren't that many. He said a roof over your head. Yes, that's absolutely necessary. And food on the table. Okay, great. I'm behind both of those. You need to have money, enough money for both of those before you get married. That doesn't take that much money. You can complain about the economy all you want. You can complain about not having enough money for this or that, but most people, if you're not impoverished, again, I'm not talking about everybody here. I'm just saying if you're in a position where you actually have income, most people can afford those things, a place to live and food, and they can pay your, their utilities and, and stuff like that. Most people can, even if they don't have much left over for what other people consider essentials. So getting that myth out of the way that you have to have enough money for a million things, uh, there are not, basically not that many things that are essential, I would say, to get married young. A big wedding and a big engagement ring, that's totally optional. Contrary to you know, popular opinion, if your woman, if she doesn't want a huge wedding, which my wife actually didn't, she was against the idea of a huge wedding. Um, you know, that's not that's a problem that you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about paying for a wedding. Um a huge wedding if your wife doesn't even want one. You don't, in other words, you don't just have to have a wedding because it's socially uh, normal to have a wedding. 
of fill in the blank size. You know, you don't have to do things the standard way. Um, as far as an engagement ring, this is something that I personally really wanted to have. I really wanted to have a nice engagement ring for my wife. Um, I wanted to have something totally unique that was not in existence um, for anyone else. And so I splurged a little bit on my engagement ring for Lainey. But again, I'm not saying that's a must. Like you don't have to have... There's no price that you have to have for your wedding ring that makes it worth it or a good deal or good enough per se. The only thing that matters is that your wife likes it and that it symbolizes the relationship between you two and the work that you're willing to put into your connection. It just has to show that. It doesn't have to be like I could have bought a more expensive ring than I did. I don't think it would have been wise of me to do so. I could have bought a less expensive ring than I did, um, a lot less. I could have gone away cheaper than I did, and it would have. I don't think that would have been wiser, wise of me. But I could have done that. Um, and either way, I just think if the wedding engagement ring, or the wedding and the engagement ring, are fulfilling their purposes as symbols of your connection and the work that you're willing to put into this and um, basically a permanent reminder of your promise to one another, then I don't think they need to be a certain price. And maybe you are different than me. If you feel different than me, uh, please feel free to justify yourself in the comments or through the link in the show notes, you can send me a personalized audio voice message. I would like that even more uh, to make this podcasting thing more of a conversation. Um, as I do like hearing from you there better than in the comment section or in private messages on social media. Those are great and I love those and nothing against those, but uh, please reach out to me through that link in the show notes. It just takes a couple seconds. Just record me a message on your phone. Uh, give me thanks, questions, comments, feedback, and alternate perspective, your story, anything at all. Would love to hear it. Um, and it makes this podcasting system two-way. Again, I say that all the time, but it really does. Um, so in other words, just to summarize this last paragraph that he did, uh, essentials is a broad word that often people use to encompass things that are not really essential. And so you don't have to have a million things in order to get married, you just need the actual essentials. Um, so he says, you don't need to do this alone. Your future bride may want to contribute as well, perhaps by having a job or a plan to earn a degree or learn marketable skills. Um, and there's, there's kind of two different philosophies on this. Some people cite Proverbs 31 about the woman uh, selling goods and, and making clothes and selling things uh, to provide for her family and have wealth. Um, and other people talk about the idea of a housekeeping uh, skill and how that is more important to have in a partner. Um, and either way, I think you go, I mean, you're going to get different benefits. Your house is going to be better cared for. You're, you probably live a little bit more comfortably in, in your home if you have somebody who can full-time take care of the home and the children. Um, but you'll probably have a little bit more as far as eating out and, and wealth to spend on you know luxurious things if you both work. And so this is kind of a life decision, a life choice for you, kind of like which one you would prefer. Um, but I would say it's not necessary. In other words, you don't have to have this again uh, to get married. Now, I will say that because you make less when you're young, simply because you don't have experience and, and you can't generate as much value for people, um, it, oftentimes what happens when people get married young is they both work, both, partner, both partners in the relationship will work. Um, that's what my wife and I are doing. My wife and I, um, we're not really shy about finances, especially because I'm trying to help other people get married young. So I make 47000 a year right now um, with three months off in the summer and every weekend a government holiday and, and school break off to do other jobs if I need to. Um, but all that time I get off and I make 47000 a year, my wife makes about the same. So we're, we're pulling in, you know, uh, let's see here, ninety to 100000 a year. Um, that's a very comfortable living situation for, you know, two people. Like if you have a family, it probably gets more expensive than that. But again, just, I'm just talking about the getting married stage. Um, if you, if you can just, you, in other words, we have way beyond what we would need to get married younger than we did. Like we could have gotten married younger, um, even when we were making less and been still very comfortable. That's my point. Like we have extra money now that we're using to save for our house. Most, you don't have to be in that situation. Um, 
you can make way less than we do again, cause we're a little bit older, I would think than the ideal age to get married young 20. Uh, I'm 25. My wife is 22. Um, you could get married way younger than that and still make plenty of money. Um, and so I'm going to give you kind of some practical ways to do that later. But he says, and I like how he's saying this here. He says, remember, you don't need to have a perfect job or even a particularly well-paying job to afford marriage. And that is absolutely true. You don't have to have a perfect job. Well, first of all, if you're waiting for the perfect job, you're never going to get married because uh, the perfect job is often this elusive, evasive thing that you never end up finding. I hate to break it to you, but the perfect job um, just might not be out there. It might, the perfect job in your head might not exist. And so it might not be feasible for you. It might not actually be practical. And so sometimes, and I think what most people do is they just have to have a job that they can tolerate a job that they like a job that they are okay with, or a job that they love elements of, they might not love the whole, you know, everything entailed with that job, but they love parts of it. And so they can, you know, put passion into those parts and therefore not be miserable in their jo working their job. Now, um, I think it's part of a man's sacrifice to be willing to work a job that, you know, he doesn't really isn't passionate about, but not my point is not again. What do you value here? Do you value getting a job that you're passionate about or do you value spending more time with your partner? When you hold things up in that light, it seems very clear to me which one matters more there. I would work at Chick-fil-A again in order to get married young. Like if I, if I didn't have my better job now, I would go back to fast food to get married young. No question. No question at all. And the reason, of course, is that I value my time with my wife, my time uh, with the person I love most in the world, uh, more than I value financial comfort. And so if you're like me in that, it's really a no-brainer or no question. You're not going to waste time with your partner just to so that you can hunt down the perfect job, especially because that perfect job might not even exist or be feasible. And so um, you just need a job that is secure, a job that's secure that you can provide for a wife for, uh, with. And so, um, again, don't just put things off waiting for perfection because perfection is never going to come and you'll never get married if you do that. Um, until you're driven by need and necessity and you're in a bad situation uh, with your prospects. That happens to a lot of people. He says, you don't need to wait until you can afford a big wedding or a big down payment on a house. Also true. Again, those are things that rob you of time with your partner. Which one matters more? More comfortable finances or more time with your partner? To me, the answer is clear. Perhaps you disagree. Reach out. Let me know if you, again, no condemnation to anybody who disagrees. I'm not being condescending in the way I'm talking. I'm just justifying the reasons for that someone might find themselves uh, wanting to get married young and that being a good thing. Uh, he says, you may be living off of student loans or a tiny apartment. Don't confuse affording marriage with affording a huge diamond ring or brand new furniture. You need to provide for the essentials like food, clothing, utilities, basically the same things you need as a single person. This is wonderful. Here he's giving you the actual basic necessities that you need. You're going to need enough. I agree. If you can't afford these three things, I would not get married. You need to have a, you need to have a means of supporting yourself with these three things, food, clothing, utilities. Those are what you really need. Again, there may be more things that I've forgotten about, but my point is a lot of people think that necessities, that essentials are, you know, way encapsulate way more than they actually do. And so a lot of people postpone getting married because they don't make X number of figures and they can't afford X number of things when in reality, like 99% of those things aren't necessary um, and are really just, you know, again, I would say waste of your time as far as what you're waiting for. Uh, he says, I don't know where you are in terms of starting your career path, but I want you to know this. God has plans for you. Finding your first job is an opportunity to learn to trust God. Ch changing jobs as the need arises is also a chance to grow in faith. Instead of being anxious about how God the Father will provide for you and your family, trust Jesus' words to his disciples. Quote, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Uh, he goes on to say as well, I think there, Matthew six thirty three: Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Matthew 6, 33. That is a wonderful verse. Um, again, just getting your priorities straight. And again, I think personally, and it, the Bible doesn't define the kingdom of God. I, I've, I talked about this before, but personally, I think that the kingdom of God has a lot to do with service to others. And marriage is the best place of service you are ever going to get. 
It is the place where service is more possible uh, and in a more intimate way than any other form of service. And and I don't say that lightly. And so I think that the kingdom of God, um, seeking that first, is totally in line with getting married because there is no place in the entire world, no form of service that is higher than that, guys. Um, and so, again, seek first the kingdom of God. What does the kingdom of God include? Well, the, while Scripture doesn't define it, it does tell us what it is. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit, uh, serving others, um, putting, practicing self-giving love, putting your friend's life before yours, laying your life down for your friends, um, you know, carrying on generational legacies. All these things are values that are wrapped up in marriage. And so marriage is much more in line, I would say, with the kingdom of God than, you know, a comfortable, luxurious lifestyle, which oftentimes is antithetical to the kingdom of God and sets itself up against what God is trying to do. Not that wealth and luxury is bad. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that um, here we have marriage that is, you know, clearly in line with the kingdom of God. And then our other option is, you know, individualistic pursuit and luxurious living, which are values that I think don't fall as often into alignment with the kingdom of God. And so he says, how does God normally provide for us financially? It's through our jobs. We can look to him to give us all we need, including employment. Um, can we afford children? So this gets into the question of um, contraception. And because if you're getting married and you're having sexual relations with your partner, children are the natural overflow of that. And so if you're not ready to have children, um, there is an argument to be made that you're not ready to get married <laughs> if you believe that contraception is wrong. If you don't believe that contraception is wrong, then you then this question is kind of irrelevant for you because you can get married, use contraception, and live without supporting a child. And so this kind of depends on your worldview here. I'm not going to get into the debate between, uh, you know, is contraception a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not going to get that here. We're talking about just basically how to get married on, you know, a low wage. Um and he says here, after cleaving together, Adam and Eve are told to be fruitful and multiply. Um, again, I agree with the scriptural command to you know bear children and all that. Is he says as time goes on, you and your spouse will probably start thinking about expanding your family. Finances also enter into this equation. It's wise to consider whether you can reasonably provide for an extra mouth to feed and body to clothe. I do think, though, I do want to add this here. I'm not a parent yet, so I can't speak to this from personal experience. But a lot of the people uh, that I know who have young children right now, it's not. Ex it's not like as expensive as you would think it would be. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's not expensive. I know it, there are lots of additional expenses that come with that, but I'm saying it's not as crazy as you'd think. There are ways to make it much more manageable, just like there are ways to make everything more manageable. So you don't need to not enter a new and beautiful season that God has called you to just because it's going to require you to stretch a bit. Um, and so, again, that's not a good reason, I would say, to avoid getting married young. Uh, he says the potential loss of income or added expenses for childcare have to be weighed carefully. My parents lived on a single income and raised three children on that single income for my whole life. Like you can't tell me that it's impossible to get married and you know, um, you know, have enough for children that may happen. That it that, that doesn't make any sense to me. My parents live in probably a three thousand square foot house. They have. You know, the their only debt, I think, is a car payment and a mortgage. Um, and, you know, we lived comfortably. Like, we ate out every week. We had a huge number of gifts at Christmas. We had food that we liked. Every day we had cooked meals. Um, or every other day now. They've kind of slacked off on that. Don't tell them I said that, but <laughs> it's true. Um, but they, basically, we lived really comfortably on just a teacher's salary. Uh, my dad, granted, did have a master's degree, so that upped the amount of money that he made on his teacher's salary, so he makes more than the average teacher. But you get my point. Just through one teacher's salary, mom quit teaching when we were born, cut their salary in half uh, to raise her children, and we were still fine financially. It was difficult at times, sure, but we were fine, and we had our time together, and they had children, and dad was supporting us wonderfully. So again, it's like, what do you value? Do you value spending time with your children? Do you value having children? Or do you value having more like, you know, 10 extra dollars in your pocket every day? Um, and I'm sure it's more than that, but you get my, you get my point. Um, do you value having a hundred extra dollars every day, a thousand extra dollars every day? Uh, thousands a lot, but you get what I'm saying. 
I, I underestimated and then over, <laughs> overestimated there. But my point is, what do you value? Um, it is absolutely possible to have children and sustain them. So do you value having more money instead of children? Or do you value, value having children instead of money? And to me, again, the answer is very clear there. But uh, moving on, it says, but you don't need to wait until you have a fully stocked nursery or a fully funded 529 plan to have your babies. Again, you need to be able to provide essentials such as diapers, clothing, and food. Again, I like how he's making it the practical. What do you need to have a baby? Diapers, clothing, and food. That's a great start. I mean, you're going to need those things. So um, do you have enough for those? Budget that in. Do you have enough? If you don't, you need to find a way to have enough. Other than that, there's not much else that's absolutely necess necessary. Insurance will probably be a little bit different. Again, that's not that much. Um, so just like the essentials, just the essentials. It says children are part of God's good design. If he blesses you with a baby, whether you feel ready or not, he will provide. And the challenges of reworking budgets and making sacrifices for your precious little ones will give you and your wife the opportunity to work together as a team and grow in selflessness. Um, a couple of little things that stick up about that paragraph. Children are a part of God's design. Absolutely. Or of God's good design. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think that's clear in the, the, the way that sexuality works. A healthy sexual relationship makes possible children. Um, the sexual love between a man and a woman brings children into the world naturally. That's just inescapable. You can't, contraceptives don't change that. Contraceptives don't have the authority to, or the power to change God's design for sexuality. Nothing you do can separate what God's designed sexuality to be. And so children are a part of that. And so Children are part of God's design. If you believe you, that having a healthy sexual relationship is a good thing, then that naturally leads me to believe that having children is a wonderful part of that. And so if he blesses you with a baby, whether you feel ready or not, he will provide. This I do agree with, with a small caveat of if you decide to sit on your lazy butt and do nothing, um, that's your prerogative, and you can be a lousy father and do that, and your family will suffer. Um, because God actually gives you power to make good decisions. Um, you know, Believe it or not, the quality of your life is ultimately up to the quality of the decisions that you make, and you can choose to sit on your bum and be lazy, but your family's going to suffer. And so, um, I, yes, I think God provides for his own, but I think a lot of times the way that he provides for people is by, um, you know, giving a wife and child a good man to look after them. And so you need to be that good man, and you have the ability not to be that good man, too. You have the ability to stomp on the will of heaven and say, I am going to be a douchebag. and and Kudos to you for doing that, man. I mean, wonderful job ruining everyone's life around you. Um, but for the majority of you who are going to choose to do the right thing and to be responsible and good stewards of what God has entrusted you with um, and to take care of the people that God has given you to take care of, um, you will be provided for, man. You you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. Um. And a lot of people do. A lot of people worry about not having enough. And and I'm a worrier. I mean, I worry all the time. I worry more than my dad worries a lot. And I got that right from him. I worry about every little thing that is involved with raising a family. Right now, my big worry is my house. All the stuff that I'm worried about with um, the building process and getting the, the, build, the builder's loan, the first-time homeowner's loan, and making sure that the, every all the lines under the ground of my property are marked before I dig and getting a contractor or doing all the work myself to fire and find the tradesmen and all this stuff that I'm worried about. But at the end, in the end, I think that as, because I'm willing to put in the work, God is going to provide. You know, I can't I can't guarantee God's provision. I don't have the power or authority to do that, but I can control my actions and I can take steps to work for my home and God can provide for my wife through my hard work. And that is a beautiful thing, I think. So guys, just don't quit working, um, but God, God provides for you and he always works together for the good of those who love him. That is so scriptural. He's not gonna, in other words, God doesn't guarantee you a pain-free life. He doesn't guarantee you a, a life without suffering and, and problems. He doesn't guarantee you um, you know, a, a house dropped in your lap or a perfect marriage dropped in your lap. He gives you the blessing of the choice to pursue that and acquire it and chase it. That's what he gives you. And so you can do with that what you will. Um, his next subheading is God will lead you. He says, let me leave you with this. Living God's way in accordance with his word and the wisdom he provides is always what's best. His plans are perfect. He knows what you need because he designed you. His provision of a godly woman to marry and of an education, of a job, of children is something that you can trust and rejoice in. 
He says, allow me to modify the title of a children's book by Dr. Seuss. Oh, the places the Lord will lead you to go. <laughs> um, so that's a, oh, the places you'll go, I think is the Dr. Seuss book. And then, oh, the places the Lord will lead you to go is his version. That's pretty cute. He says, as, cons as you consistently commit yourself and your future family to God's purposes, he'll provide exceedingly abundantly and far beyond all that you can ask or expect. Ch Christian marriages is a great adventure where your faith will grow immensely. You'll learn to trust God and lean on his promises. You'll see God's faithfulness um, as he leads you through every season of life. You'll experience the joy of the Lord in your relationship and beyond that, your marriage. Um, and that's so true, just all the things that God does for you. I think a lot of times people don't realize. Um, and again, I'm not discounting personal responsibility in saying that. You still don't have a role to play in that. Um, but the Lord is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. That awesome song is just something um, that so many people who are older will sing and love. And that tells us something about the character of God. Because those of us in life who have seen the most, for them to sing about God's faithfulness says something about the, you know, the, how it lasts and all that they've been through. For them to still sing that to me just says something about God's faithfulness uh, because they've seen a lot. And for them to still think that God is faithful is, is huge. Um, I do want to read you kind of a quote before I wrap this up here. Um, you know, there's, there's this underlying theme in Christianity that you have to be ready to get married. And even in secularism that you have to be ready to get married. And, I don't, I think that that's a bad question. Am I ready to get married? I think is a bad question um, from which to enter a marriage or be, begin thinking about entering marriage. Um, this is a, this is a, I'm going to share this tab so you guys can read this. This is a post that I wrote years ago on the choice to get married um, and just why I think it's a good, a good thing for it. And it was a good thing for me. I don't regret it. I've been married a year now. My, my, First anniversary was two days ago. I just, it was an awesome time. Um, this last year has been amazing. And I can tell you from personal experience that had I, you know, postponed marriage into the future, uh, it would have just been the most, it would have felt like just the biggest waste of time that I have. Like the one life that I get, it would have felt like the biggest waste to go even one more day than I did without being married to Lainey. I mean, gosh, I just cannot imagine having gone any longer than I did without her. I would have gotten married to her sooner had I found her sooner. I mean, I just, so I, from my personal experience, everything that I'm saying lines up with that, guys. I'm not just some idealist who reads the benefits about of getting married young on the internet and then spews them to you without them lining with my life experience. This is actually what I've lived. What I'm saying about all all 260, however many episodes we've done, are all in alignment with my experience. Guys, as a young believer, pursuing the goal of marriage and family, everything I've said, and I don't believe I'm unique. I think there are a lot of people out there who um, could benefit from what I'm saying, and that's what I'm do why I'm doing this. And that's why, and I know there are, because a lot of you have reached out to me and talked to me about it. And so... Um, yeah, I just I just wanted to say that. But this is the article that I wrote. It says, for one reason, this is in relation to the the idea of, am I ready to get married? That question that people already always ask themselves that I don't think is healthy. Um, I have a little paragraph or two for you on that. He sa it says, for one reason or another, each of these arguments have the common thread of urging young people to be quote unquote ready before tying the knot. And while this concern is valid, and I do not wish to diminish the importance of preparation, and wisdom, I believe that there is also an element of truth to the argument that one can never be wholly ready for marriage, and that a better question for young people might be, are you willing to embrace the challenges that youthful, youthful marriage entails for the sake of one another and the benefits that getting married young offers? Taking a break there, Scripture says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. He endured the difficulty for the joy set before him, and didn't, he didn't avoid Calvary because it was difficult. You know, he took the hard road for the sake of the joy set before him. It was worth it to him. Um, and so that, man, that is just a powerful thing, guys. You don't have to take the easy road. You can take the hard road for the sake of the joy set before you. Getting married young has difficulties, but getting married older does not. 
but that doesn't mean it's a bad decision because of the joy set before you that you get more time with your spouse, a healthier sexual life, you know, thing, th things like this. Um, golly, it's, it's powerful, you know, continuing on. It says, when I read the gospel, observing Jesus's emphasis, emphasis on trust, when I examine my own life, reflecting on the many times I've had to step out in faith, like Indiana Jones in the last crusade, when I look back into history, calling the many times unprepared people have flourished in meager situations, I don't see a God who requires mastery of one level before entrance into another. Instead, I see a God who designed humanity to learn while out of our depth. Um, and that, I think, is just the epitome of what I'm trying to share to you today. Being ready is not the focus. It's the willingness to put in the work to make a healthy marriage for yourself. That's what you've got to have. Beyond the ability to provide for your family, beyond the ability to put bread on the table, beyond the ability to acquire all the necessary essentials, so to speak, that you have to have before you get married, the main thing you want to have is the willingness to pick up your cross figuratively for the joy set before you. That's what you've got to have. Because if you don't have the willingness and the ability and the grit to pick up your cross for the joy set before you, that's when your marriage isn't going to make it. That's when you're not going to be able to get married. That's when you are, you know, fill in the blank, not going to be able to get the gold is because you didn't have the willingness, the determination, the ability, the, the fixation to do the difficult thing to get the, the prize. Um, and so if I, if I can get anything across to you today, it's not so much that you have to be at a certain financial point in order to be married. It's that you have to be a point where you can tell, you can answer the question, am I willing to do whatever it takes to have a healthy marriage with yes, that's what you have to, that's where you have to be. That's when you're ready to get married. When you can say, am I willing to, um, deal with a job that I don't, that isn't my favorite in order to get married? Am I willing to work uh, with this annoying person or in this field that I don't like in order to get married? Am I willing to give up a second income in order to have more time with my wife and make her more comfortable? Am I willing to give up a second income in order to have children? Am I willing to work hard to provide for my family? If you can answer all those questions, yes, my friend, you are ready to get married. And so I hope you guys have enjoyed listening to this episode today. If it's generated value for you or encouraged you that it is possible to do great things when you're young, reach out and let me know what you thought of this episode through the link in the show notes. You can send me that personalized audio voice message. Give me again, thanks, questions, comments, comments, feedback, and alternate perspective, your story, anything at all. I would love to hear from you there. It would make me feel super connected to you as an audience member, and it would make the podcast system two-way. You can also follow the Restoring Report podcast on Instagram and Facebook, as well as check out our YouTube, YouTube channel. We've been getting more views on there recently than we have on the podcasts. So go listen there and watch the video content that we're producing. Uh, you can also follow the show on Instagram and Facebook if you're interested in the content we post. So thank you guys so much for listening today, and we will talk to you all next time.